of our lives, particularly our family lives. While we as a faith leaders are focused today on how to liberate and solve the long sufferings of a people of a divided nation, we also cannot avoid thinking of those suffering from the terrible tornado destruction in the Midwest. Mm. We want to pray for them and those who, uh, those who are working to serve and heal these devastated communities. At this time, I would like to invite the moderator of today's program, Dr. Michael Jenkins, the president of UPF International and chairman of UPF North America. Dr. Jenkins, the floor is yours. Thank you, Vice President Duggan, and to our listening audience, audience and viewing audience in America and through many countries throughout the world, we uh, welcome you to our program every week. On Tuesday, we have a special program sponsored by the UPF and the Washington Times Foundation, which covers different aspects of bringing peace in Northeast Asia, particularly the peaceful reunification of North and South Korea. Today, we're focused on the Interreligious Association for Peace and Development, which is focused on the perspectives of faith leaders or people of faith who are, have been able to give a very significant contributions to the dialogue and the efforts towards peace in the Korean Peninsula. Our first speaker today will be Archbishop George Augustus Stallings, Jr. He is the founder and the presiding bishop of Monty Temple African American Congregation. He served as a Roman Catholic priest from 1974 to 1989. In 1990, 1989, he felt called to form an independent ministry. Highly respected, he was educated in Rome at the Pontifical North American College, and he is a person that has a great love for all humanity. He uh, was the youngest priest to be uh, 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 installed in, in America as the uh, full uh, senior priest and pastor of, of a Roman Catholic church. He also has been a person that's led a coalition of clergy, which he helped to found called the American Clergy Leadership Conference, which has uh, associates of over 20,000 clergy in the United States. He uh, also is a person that really has a great love for family as a beautiful family with two children. And I would like you to welcome at this time, who is now the chairman of the oh. UPF IAPD, the chairman for North America, Archbishop George Augustus Stallings, Jr. Thank you very much, Dr. Jenkins. It is indeed a privilege and pleasure to be here, not just simply with other noted uh, spiritual and religious leaders uh, for this uh, program today as we look at the reunification of the Korean, Korean Peninsula, Peninsula, especially from the vantage point of a peaceful reunification of the land of the morning call known as Korea. But to realize that this is also family, I feel a special connection to each and every one of our speakers today and to our viewing audience. I thank God each and every day for having been called and chosen for ordained ministry as, as at such a time as this. If it were my own druthers, I don't think I ever would have been a priest, no less a bishop and a founder of an autonomous Catholic expression of the Christian faith known as Imani Temple if it were not for having been called and chosen and coming to the realization that uh, my life is not my own. That was not something that I realized early on in life, but uh, as I grew in ministry and became much and more involved and interface with not only national, but international work, especially on the Korean Peninsula, that I came to realize that my life does not belong to me, that it, that it is the life of the spirit of the living God uh, within me and that my real identity in order to affect change in society, in my own family, in my own community, tribe, nation and world, all hinges on the reality that life 
itself is a gift. It is something that has been given uh, to each and every one of us, not for our own benefit or self-aggrandizement, but to be used for the purpose of edification or for building up uh, our world to the extent that we come to realize that we are all one universal family under God. Uh, there are two persons who have had, uh, I should say, uh, two entities that have had a major influence in my life uh, in ministry, um, Martin Luther King Jr. and the Reverend Dr. Sum Young Moon and his beloved wife, Dr. Hakta Han Moon, in their vision for creating a world of peace where we learn to live for the sake of others. And that in the words of Paul's letter to the church uh, at Rome, found in Romans chapter 14, verses seven through nine, that none of us lives for oneself and none of us dies for oneself. If we live, we are responsible to the Lord. And if we die, we die as his servants. So whether we live or die, we are the Lord. So for me, uh, this physical sojourn on earth, Dr. Thomas Ward, has been very much rooted in a deep sense of spirituality, to realize, realizing that I'm essentially a spiritual being practicing to be human, not a human being attempting to become spiritual. And that there is a, 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 an identity that I possess that links all of us together into this one as Dr. King calls it, a network of mutuality tied in a single garment of destiny. Uh, Martin Luther King Jr. in that letter written from the Birmingham jail in uh, April of 1963 uh, to white ministers who were questioning his role or, or presence in Birmingham, Alabama, said in a real sense, all of life is interrelated all men and women are caught in an inescapable network of mutuality tied in a single garment of destiny. What affects one directly affects all indirectly. Uh, I can never be what I ought to be until you are what you ought to be. And you can never be what you ought to be until I am what I ought to be. And King says, this is the interrelated structure of reality. So I share that as a, a prolegomenon or a preface to say that my work and involvement in uh, Korea, uh, in this land of the morning calm over the past 20 years has, has emboldened me in, that, in those spiritual divine principles that uh, as I look at what occurred as a result of the Korean War, from 1950 to 1953, and we're beyond the 70th anniversary of the of, of that of the beginning of that uh, war, and how that one nation, one people, one race, one culture came divided at the 38th parallel, and I said to myself, but if I have this vision or understanding as a religious leader that we are all formed and fashioned in the divine image and likeness of God, and that there is a commonality that binds us together as people, then I'm dealing with the whole subject is how can we not see the interconnectedness that exists in a place that's thousands of miles away from us in the United States of America? and not realize that there is a commonality that binds us together and what may be affecting the people directly in North and South Korea indirectly affects each and every one of us. We cannot become so innocuous to, to world events that somehow what happens on the other side of the globe does not really have a ramification or a rippling effect upon each and every one of us. Yes, it does. And so when I, first visited uh, Korea, South Korea, uh, in 2001, and had the opportunity to visit the 38th parallel. My heart was literally touched and moved by the pain that I felt being experienced by people who 
are of one blood, if you will, one land mass, separated and divided. And that there were family members on both sides of the 38th parallel that could not even see each other because of what I would describe as man's inhumanity towards man. And I said that as a member of the American Clergy Leadership Conference, which is a broad-based coalition of Christian ministers focusing, focused on rebuilding the family, restoring the community and renewing the nation and the world, that our presence in Korea as Christian ministers had to transcend race, denomination, culture, class, and to realize that single cord that binds all of us together as children of God. I take my relationship to God very seriously. And I realize that the God in me must constantly acknowledge his presence and must consistently seek the God in you and in, in all of humanity. I fall short at times. I miss the mark. That's the real meaning of sin. Yet I realize that I can never allow my own misgivings, my shortcomings and failings to prevent me from having a, a broad mind that thinks globally yet acts locally. And so I began to realize that if I'm to be true to, to ordain ministry, to my calling, having been chosen, that I have to have the mindset of, of a divine being robed in flesh, a spirit being robed in flesh, and, and, and do all that I could in my collective power to make a difference. Uh, and so I realized that my position is not, you know, dealing with hardcore diplomacy is, 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 is what we call that soft uh, power approach to the situation where we engage in, or we take approach it from a people to people engagement. And that is where I see us as religious leaders uh, contributing towards a, an atmosphere of, of potential change that could take place on the Korean Peninsula that we see ourselves yes. as spiritual or religious leaders. And, and John Maxwell, the guru of, of leadership says that leadership plainly put is one who has, who has influence. And that's what it comes down to, that we can simply, we have the ability to influence the situation just by people to people engagement. And so as American Clergy Leadership Conference, we have engaged in work with uh, the religious leadership uh, in South Korea, praying for the day in which there can be a move of the spirit within each and every one of us that takes us beyond just simply hard power diplomacy. Our appeal as leaders, as religious leaders, at least from my perspective, is not a plea to heads of state, of North and South Korea, nor to their legislative or judicial branches. But I see our role, our, our work, our ministry as appealing to men and women of goodwill who believe in the spiritual origins of all humankind that binds us together as children of God, as one universal family under God, and that we acknowledge that the one that from whom we have come and our purpose for existence, the reason why we live, move, and have our being is because we believe in the universality of all humankind. That the best way we reflect the presence of the invisible God in our world is through the visible, tangible way in which God is manifested within each and every one of us. So I'm very optimistic, especially due to the, to the unswerving loyalty and commitment that the mother of peace, Dr. Hak Jahan Moon, has to that reunification of North and South Korea. I can say without one scintilla of a doubt that Mother Moon has as her primary focus the reunification of her homeland. Born in North Korea, living with her husband in South Korea, that her ultimate dream in her physical life is to see the reunification of North and South Korea brothers and sisters, relatives and close friends coming together to live as one prior to the Korean War of 1950. And that once that happens, we will see the beginning of, of 
peace, not only in North, between North and South Korea, but also in the Middle East. We're gonna see peace in other areas of the world because so much hinges on what takes place in North and South Korea. So my focus and my energies in this whole effort for the reunification of the Korean Peninsula is that it can, can truly measure up to its name, the land of the morning call. Amen, amen. And that when people go there, Beautiful. they will be able to see that even after all of the strife, the enmity, the conflict, the hostility, and the strife, that men and women can still find that commonality, that common thread that binds all of us together as one universal family under God. And that if we can achieve this in North, between North and South Korea, it can be achieved anywhere in the world. So thank you for allowing me this opportunity to share this with you. I close out with the, the words of Paul, the apostle Paul to the church at Ephesus recorded in Ephesians chapter four, verse three, a particular translation says, make every effort to preserve the unity which has the spirit as its origin and peace as its binding force. And if we are all spirit beings robed in flesh, we must strive to bring about unity in every community, in every house, in every nation around the world so that peace can reside and we can experience the kingdom of God, also known as the kingdom of heaven here on earth. Thank you. Hansel. Thank you, Archbishop Stallings. Thank you. What a wonderful presentation. Your heart comes through. You've been dozens of times to the Republic of Korea. And also you were called by Mother Moon to help co-found the Korean Christian Leadership Conference, which yes. is led by Reverend Suman Kim, uh, who is a Presbyterian pastor there with a beautiful church. And, and now they have several hundred clergy collaborating together with the ACLC and the IAPD that uh, Archbishop Stallings is chairman of. Thank you, Archbishop. Welcome home. Thank you, Dr. Thank you. Our next uh, guest is a renowned Imam, a great Muslim faith leader, but he's an interfaith leader recognized by uh, the city of Hamtramck in Detroit and the mayor there, and also by Wayne County Executive Karen Majewski, and also Warren Evans and key leaders throughout the state of Michigan have honored his, his work. The Michigan Conference of the United Methodist Church honored him with the Ambassador for Interreligious Relationships appointment. Imam Husik speaks and delivers sermons at multi-religious places of worship and universities. He's spoken at social justice and human rights press conferences, international conferences for peace and love. He's been a prominent figure in dialogue and in uh, also a presentation with the Universal Peace Federation. He's also an ambassador for peace. He really advocates the whole understanding that we should pray together as faith leaders to the one God uh, that loves and protects us all. He's traveled throughout the Middle East and Africa, Egypt, Europe, Canada, and Turkey, and also South Korea. He came with us on, on uh, important occasions. Let's welcome at this time Imam Arif Husik. Thank you. Welcome. Thank you, Dr. Jenkins, for such a beautiful introduction. Uh, that is really an honor and privilege of mine to be here in this interfaith forum organized by IAPD. In the name of God, Allah, most gracious, most merciful. Assalamu alaikum wa barakatuh which means peace and blessings of Allah, God Almighty be on you all. Our praise is for Allah, Lord of the worlds, and may peace and blessings be upon the noble messenger Muhammad, upon his entire family and upon his companions and the righteous ones who follow in their footsteps until the day of judgment. Dear respected mother of peace, Dr. Haq Jahan Moon, thank you for continuing this beautiful movement that your husband, Reverend Sam Young Moon initiated. Dear respected, dear excellencies, Dr. Thomas Walsh, Dr. Michael Jenkins, Archbishop George Stellings, Bishop Dr. Lonnie, 
Abram Rose, Reverend David Kesbo, Reverend Leslie O. Daniel Rigney, dear respected sister Tammy Kodagan, Reverend Bill Stoner, Reverend Bruce Grodner, respected Svetlana Taub, brother William Archbold, and all of this beautiful movement leadership and followers. Mm -hmm. Thank you for our friendship and your sincerity in continuing dream and legacy of unifying all people as one family under God Almighty, initiated by our beloved brother, Reverend Moon, and his the honorable wife, mother of peace, Dr. Hak Jahan Moon. And with your tirelessly work, it is spread out through the world around. Please let's salute their dream and your work with the applause around. Thank you, thank you, all of you. God bless you. I'm grateful to Allah Almighty for our working together in past two decades throughout United States of America Worldwide Summit 2020 in Korea. And I am looking forward to continuing our efforts for all people tomorrow's betterment. Even I had shortened my visit to my parents in Bosnia with their agreement to be with you in Korea. But as oh. my mom and dad said, Son, we know that you are on the right path, so go ahead, carry on. And brothers and sisters in humanity, here we are. I thank you for all the hospitalities, especially for making sure uh, for halal foods and special places for me, my brother Imam Muhammad Ali Ilahi and other Muslims brothers and sisters attended to your events and that is some of their things that brings us to working together for the future betterment. Our, the, the places that you prepare for our prayers is most appreciated. Thank you. Dear respected sister Tommy Kodagan, thank you for the invitation to this beautiful IAPD Peace Forum and respect and request to speak along with Dr. Suzanne Schalti and Dr. Thomas Wall on the same topic towards reunification on the Korean Peninsula, principles of peace building and reconciliation between brothers. This prolonged topic is very important, but never long enough that we cannot discuss about it because it is better to discuss the whole year instead of one only day of war. First of all, I am Imam Ari Fuski, born and raised in Europe, in country, in, in country made of two peninsulas, beautiful Bosnia and Herzegovina, just like Michigan, Upper and Down Peninsula, just like Korea, North, South, North and South Korea, which is recognized for its natural beauty, farming, economical and industrial development, where is a mosque and church and a synagogue located next to each other and sharing the same parking lot and our, those three religion people doing shopping in the same stores, eating the same kind of food and sweets, drinking the same coffee and tea. We also using the same bathrooms for our needs. And our kids used to stay overnight and over weekends at each other's houses and remember, that our girls and boys has been treating each other as a biological brothers and sisters. But remarkable is that we Muslim have had survival of 11 genocides, which last one happened in the modern 20th century between 92 and 95, where the aggressor killed more than 200,000 Muslims, destroyed totally and partially about thousands of mosques and cultural centers, industry, economical and natural wealth. And in 10 days slaughtered 8,372 Muslims mostly civilians, kids, women, and seniors in the city of Srebrenica alone between July 11 and 22, 95, and the same aggressor, even this time, those days and today, trying to attack Bosnia to continue genocide, what he started 26 years ago in July 1995. I am speaking this to you today and asking you to support peace building and reconciliation between Bosnia and the aggressor, 
by involving the United Nations and its Security Council, along with the entire leadership of humanity, to stop fear and atrocity and to build peace and unity. This is also what Reverend Sun Myung Moon mentioned in his book as Peace Loving Global Citizens, page five. And I ask God Almighty to bless Reverend Moon so continue to grant him wisdom and energy to his wife, mother of peace, Dr. Hak Jahan Moon, and his entire leadership to carry on to develop his beautiful legacy for peace and development. Please say, Amen. Amen. Even remembering Holocaust and genocide makes me more to work on interfaith dialogue because Islam religion and tradition is with its teaching and practices of nonviolence and peace building is always a key towards reconciliation. Everywhere and reconciliation everywhere. And Allah Almighty says in the Holy Quran, Surah Ashura, or in translation chapter, the consultation 42 and verse 40, whoever pardons and seeks reconciliation, then their reward is with Allah, with God Almighty. So brothers and sisters in humanity, that really is that we need none else but reward for, from Allah for hereafter, inshallah, God willing. In our interfaith dialogues, the most important thing besides golden rule, love your neighbor as yourself, as Jesus, peace be upon him said, or as prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him said, do to your neighbors as you want them to do to you. Help one another. Also, Allah Almighty in the Holy Quran says, not only to Muslims, but to the entire humanity in Surah al hujurat or in translation chapter, the inner apartments of the prophet, chapter 49 and verse 13. O mankind, we have created you from a single pair of male and female, and made you into nations and tribes that you may know one another, not that you may hate each other. Surely the most honorable of you in the sight of Allah is the who is the most righteous of you. Verily, Allah is all-knowing and is well aware of all things. Generally, the most important thing is to know that the whole world agree that Islam is a religion of peace and the appreciation of Islamic percepts will bring justice, harmony, and order, and consequently peace to the world. Since its formative years, Muslim communities have been empowered by various Islamic values and principles of peace, I mean, I mean. which has allowed Muslim men and women to resolve their conflicts peacefully and to establish social justice, political, and economic systems. In most Muslim communities, Islam plays an important role in social and political life and religion is one of the key components of people's identity, both as cultural framework and as a religious creed. Well, we are always about, we are always talking about peace or establishing peace wherever necessary that is. And I am too, 100% for peace everywhere. How to make peace? To me, that is the same as someone looking for a Jesus, peace be upon him. I am saying to people, do not look for Jesus, rather be Jesus. Visit your next door neighbors. House, help them with any necessity as food, clean drinking water, clothing, help them pay their bills or hug your neighbors and give them a hard-heartedly hard smile and work together on beautifying your neighborhood, whether we do in here in America, Bosnia, Middle East countries, Africa, and reunifying North and South, renew, renew, re, reunifying North and South Korea. Brothers and sisters, with this, I wanted to tell you that peace starts with me from my heart, Very cannot good. look for peace in someone else if peace is not in my heart. And we cannot change someone else until we change inner ourselves. As Quran says, 
Indeed, Allah will not change the condition of all people until they change what is in themselves. Surah al rad or chapter, the thunder, number 13 and verse 11. We, the Muslim people, Thank we you. even greeting with words of peace and hugs to buy saying salam, which is one of the 99 names of God, Quran 59, 23. I believe that my presentation completing my topic from my understanding and from Islamic perspective and in conclusion, as you know that Prophet Muhammad is not here, but he is teaching and practice is in my and all Muslims heart. And I cannot wait a day to meeting respected mother of peace, dear Haq Jahan Moon, along with her movement's leadership and both Koreans presidents along with their leadership that we pray together and for sake of God Almighty and also for sake of peace in Korea, their reconciliation and reunification remove its border barricades, drinking together mixed in, mixed in one cup South and Korean tea, eating Muslim dates and baklava, recognizing Islam religion with all people of the book and welcome Islam and its territories amongst its current religions and allow Muslims to practice Islam freely and peacefully in one Korean territorial harmony and dear mother of peace. I am pleased with any building you designate for a first mosque in Korea to me. Thank you on that. And I leave you with only three short verses from Quran that said in Surah Al-Asr, the time through the ages, number 103 and verse three by the promise of time infinite. Surely man is in loss, except such as those who have faith and do righteous deeds and join together in the mutual teaching of truth and of patience and perseverance. Brothers and sisters, thank you for allowing me here. God bless you. God bless mother of peace, Dr. Hagjahan Moon and the entire world with peace and unity. Amen. Assalamu alaikum. Peace be on you. Amen, amen, shukran, thank you. Imam Huskik, we really are enlightened by your word uh, from the Quran and also your insights on Peace Starts With Me. Thank you very much. At this time, we're honored to present to you Dr. Suzanne Schulte, who's a North Korean uh, human rights expert on, on North Korea an activist and policy expert that has advised uh, the US Congress, both the Senate and the House, through testimony on key committees reviewing human rights and other aspects of the situation in North Korea. She's chairman of the North Korea Freedom Coalition. She's president of the renowned Defense Forum Foundation, co-vice chair of the Committee for Human Rights in North Korea and chair of Free North Korea Radio. She's also chair of the US Western Sahara Foundation. She's really the one of the world's leading activists and Christian uh, faith uh, uh, leaders that really understand how to help uh, Korea, especially the refugees and the, the, the defectors and people who really want to see freedom. And But she has a passion and a love for all of North Korean people as well as South Korean and she's known throughout America with all of uh, the Christian communities, but she's really uh, a very, very recognized and, and respected uh, great woman leader in South Korea. They love her there. Welcome at this time, Dr. Suzanne Schulte. Thank you. Wow. Dr. Jenkins, that was quite an intro. <laughs> all true. It's all true. <laughs> well, I... Um... <laughs> Tomiko gave me the assignment to talk about uh, what the faith community is doing to reach out to people in North Korea and also highlight what's going on with COVID-19. And, and I'm going to try to do this as quickly as possible. <laughs> so this is going to be a crash course uh, because I want to I want us to have the chance to hear Dr. Ward and take questions. So let me just tell you real quickly. Um, my motivation in all this is the is the absolute belief that we can bring about change in North Korea peaceful change in North Korea through the power of information. Uh, as, as the Bible says, you will know the truth and the truth will set you free. And the North Korean defectors that I work with, uh, that's our mantra. That's what we believe by getting information into North Korea. There's nothing more important that we can do 
than to help bring about change in North Korea by working with the North Korean defectors. They know how to get information in and they know how to how to reach the people, how do you how to format that information. And we know now that over 33, 35,000 people have escaped from North Korea and given us overwhelming evidence that crimes genocide, crimes against humanity are being committed in North Korea every day in these brutal political prisoner camps and just in the average way the citizens are treated there. Um, I, I like to uh, tell people, look at the Korean Peninsula at night. Um, you can see the lights of South Korea and this dark ex expanse between North Korea and uh, between South Korea and China. The only thing that's lit up is Pyongyang and the statues of the dictators there. Uh, but what the defectors have been doing is getting uh, information and using three techniques by land, by air and by sea. And I want to describe that to you real quickly. Very tragically, the situation has become very difficult because the current president of South Korea, Moon Jae-in, has tried to stop all of this, all these, all this work of getting information in. But the defectors have been sending in information by air using um, these balloon launches that have become uh, very controversial. There's at least 10 different groups that are, have been doing balloon launches. And the one that's the most, uh, the one that's known the most is Fighters for Free North Korea, which is founded by Park Sung Hak, who's a North Korean defector. Uh, he's pretty controversial because some of the things that he's been se sending in are, are uh, uh, by balloon are indictments of the Kim regime for the crimes that he's committed and killing his own family members, for killing Otto Warmbier, who was a college student who was visiting North Korea, who was brutally murdered. Um, but he's the one that's been the most um, controversial and most known about those. But what the defectors have been sending in through these balloon launches has been recently uh, protective PPE because of COVID. They've been sending in flash drives that have information, South Korea, soap operas, Western movies. Um, the Bible has been a very popular thing to send in by these balloon launches. Voice of the Martyrs, a, a, a group here in the United States, has been very successful in doing these balloon launches. But they were based on something that had been developed by the American military back during um, the Korean War in an operation known as Operation Jili, Jili being the Korean word for truth, because we were trying to get information into North Korea because the regime works so hard to keep the people in the dark, to keep them unaware of the outside world. They're brainwashed from childhood to think that South Korea is occupied by the United States of America and that we're their enemy. So it's really important to get information. In, and this technique was developed, the balloon launches by the American military and the South Korean government took it over, but then they stopped it during the sunshine years because the North Korean regime was demanding these things be stopped. Um, but that's an indication of how powerful it was. And a lot the defectors were like, we can't, we've, got, we've got to take up this work. So they've been doing that. Another thing that's been very effective is radio broadcasting. The, um, the loudspeakers at the DMZ, which were ripped down by the Moon administration a couple of years ago, they were broadcasting information, just news and information from South Korea. 70% of the ground forces of the DPRK and 50% of their air and naval forces are deployed within 100 kilometers of the DMZ. So that's why the regime wanted those loudspeakers turned off. But because they could hear what was happening in South Korea, they were, we were educating the people about the truth that South Korea isn't occupied. It's a wonderful country. It's a thriving democracy with great prosperity for its people, many freedoms. One of the things that I'm most in, uh, involved in is a program called Free North Korea Radio. It's a unique partnership between North Korean escapees who do the programming and Americans who finance 100% of the shortwave transmission. And every morning and every evening, we're broadcasting news and information into North Korea. True history, true things. In fact, we've been doing messages from members of Congress for the um, for the Korean Liberation Day and for the new year. We send these in a couple times a year where members of Congress simply tell the people of North Korea, we actually really care about them. We're actually their friends. We have a problem with Kim Jong-un. We have a problem with him, but we don't have a problem with people in North Korea. In fact, we've been trying to help them and trying to come up with ways to get humanitarian aid to them. In fact, South Korea was trying to get them COVID vaccines. So these are um, the radio broadcasting using the air is really important. And I love Radio Free Asia, Voice of America, KBS, SBS, anybody who's broadcasting in North Korea. I think is great, but I wanted to tell you, Free North Korea is unique because it is a, the, the factors that do the programming and Americans that support the broadcast. 
we just got ranked um, number one website in South Korea. With We outperformed these broadcasters that have 14 times our budget. And I believe it's really because it's, if you're in North Korea and you're going to turn into a radio broadcast, you want to hear from your own people. And I think that's why we outperform everybody. The other uh, technique that's been developed is by land. Now, because of COVID, this has been a lot more difficult. But the North Korean defector organizations, one that was founded by former military, the North Korea People's Liberation Front, and one that was founded by former elites, the North Korean strategy, uh, intellectual solidarity. These two groups got together, again, defector groups, and they developed um, ways to get things across the border, the China-North Korea border. And they've been doing all kinds of things. They've been sending in shortwave radios. They've been sending in USBs with, again, South Korean soap operas, K-pop music, has become uh, something that the regime has complained about. Um, but another thing they did was they developed a thing called a, a no-tell. And this was very interesting, but this, was, this is a no-tell. And the defectors actually uh, manufactured no-tells in China and started smuggling them into North Korea. And the great thing about the no-tell is that you could read SD cards, you could read CD cards, you could actually hook it up to your TV and watch the content of movies on your, um, on the, on your no-tells. These became so popular in North Korea that the regime in 2016 had to decriminalize owning them because they couldn't stop the people from sharing information through these no-tells. And then they started manufacturing their own no-tells for, for people in North Korea. So this is another example of the defectors coming up with something creative to reach people in North Korea. And um, the other thing that they were doing is, is sending in across the border, they've been sending in choco pies, which is a, a South Korean cookie. And they've been sending those in and the North Koreans love these choco pies. It just shows them the, the uh, advancement of South Korea. They developed this really fine treat. Um, and they, again, they've been smuggling SD cards in and uh, they very small, they call it the nose card because you can hide it easily. Um, they've also been uh, using the C. This is another technique that's been developed, that's been developed recently. And it's called, it's the rice bottle launch. Now, what happened by sea is that one of the North Korean defectors who'd served in the military had been patrolling the Hongwei province coastline. And he noticed when he was in back in North Korea, a lot of South Korean trash was washing ashore. So flash forward all these decades later, he's in he's in South Korea living in freedom. He wants to reach people in his homeland. He comes up with this idea of the rice bottle launch. And so they started doing these rice bottle launches in the last uh, five or six years, sending in rice, sending in U.S. one dollar bills to use in the markets, sending in protective um, parasite medicine. Again, there's SD cards in here of information. These became very popular. But again, the Moon administration is trying to stop these. But the defectors are still doing it because they want to get aid and support to the people in, uh, that they left behind in their homeland. So the C is a bit of a big method. I want to mention one thing quickly about cell phones. You know, everyone's familiar with the fact that North Korea did set up their own cell phone system. And we, we believe that uh, at least 24 million people have, of the people in North Korea, at least 24 million now have access to, cell, to the cell phone service. Not everyone has a cell phone, but it became, it's become very popular among North Koreans to have cell phones. But I want to point out that although everybody was excited about that, it's actually become a method of surveillance because the North Korean defectors were so successful at getting things in to North Korea. The North Koreans manufactured cell phones that do not have any way to read content. And they put an app on them so they can track where you go on your cell phone. So it's actually become a method of surveillance. And I just want to quote Martin Williams, who's an expert on the North Korean uh, technology, did a report for the Committee for Human Rights in North Korea. And he said what's basically happened, they've effectively locked down the cell phone device that had the most potential for mass consumption of foreign media. They've locked it down and made it into basically a surveillance tool. But I do want to mention that because the cell, one of the things that's really important is to get cell phones into North Korea that were manufactured outside of North Korea, because then they can use the transmission towers in China to reach people. So I wanted to mention land, air, and sea, all these methods. The people, that are, the most important thing that we can be doing, uh, and I, I want to stick to the time because I know we've got, we, um, we've got Dr. Ward coming up, but I think that just wrapping up, it's so important to talk about the human rights situation in North Korea. 
because as I mentioned, they're brought, they are brainwashed from childhood to hate Americans, to hate South Koreans, to think that they live in a paradise. And when we don't talk about North Korea human rights, when we only talk about the nuclear threat, we feed the lie that the regime uses to keep the people under their thumb. The lie is that we want to hurt them. And the fact is that why are we here today? Because we care about the people of North Korea. Why are all of us with different backgrounds here today talking about this? Because we want to see peaceful unification. We have to communicate to the people of North Korea how much we care about them. And the fact, for example, that nobody needed to die during the famine. There was enough humanitarian aid that was poured into North Korea during the famine. And yet 3 million people died because the regime used it as a tool against their own people. So the number one, we must never sideline the human rights issues right now. And it's really important to press these awareness to the people of North Korea, how much we care about them. Second thing is, um, uh, Tommy Co wanted me to mention about COVID. If you go on the World Health Program website today, I checked it this morning before this talk, it says that there have been zero cases of COVID in North Korea and zero cases of deaths. Zero deaths and zero cases. We know that that's a lie. We think that they were probably impacted by COVID right after that uh, broke out in Wuhan because they share that border. So we have a situation right now where we there's so much we should be communicating and trying to help the people of North Korea and talking about our concerns about them and about COVID. We know that they shot to death a South Korean maritime official last year because they were terrified of him coming into their country. We know they have a shoot to kill order at the border. Um, so we know that they're desperately afraid of COVID. And we think that there's been a mass, huge outbreak inside North Korea. But this has led to something that's um, an opportunity for us. And that is that there are 600 to 1200 refugees, North Korean refugees in prison, in detention in China right now that we're trying to get safely to South Korea. And because North Korea refuses to accept them back, China has to deal with this issue. So we've been trying to, this is something that the faith community can really be in, involved in is pressuring and encouraging the government of China to allow these refugees safe passage to South Korea. Some of them have been able to come out, but there's still hundreds that are still there in China in detention. And these are innocent men, women, and children that were simply, in most cases, simply trying to get to South Korea. The other thing is supporting, as I mentioned, the information that the information campaign that the North Korean defector is doing. That's the most important thing we can do is help them do that, bring about peaceful unification by getting information in, becoming partners and supporting the work of the North Korean defectors. It's so important to be able to do that. Also pressuring the commission, uh, 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 uphold, uh, encouraging the United Nations to uphold their recommendations that they made during the Commission of Inquiry. Many great recommendations. Um, I'm also a big believer in humanitarian assistance. As long as we ensure it gets the groups that go in can be there to make sure it gets to its intended recipients. And as I mentioned before, no one needed to die during the famine. And we know that the conditions are almost famine-like again in North Korea. So um, with that, I just want to thank you again for giving me the opportunity to, uh, to talk about this. And I'm going to just close with one quick quote. This is from Kim hyung Soo. He was a high, uh, an elite in North Korea. He lived in Pyongyang. And he said, my friend smuggled a radio from China and I could not stop myself from listening, even though I knew I could be discovered and sent to a political prison camp. Just listening secretly to the radio for three nights decades of indoctrination were peeled away. It was through Free North Korea Radio that I found out what life was like outside North Korea. So I just want to close with that quote from a defector telling us this is what they found when they started listening to news and information from the outside. So thank you so much for this opportunity. Thank you, Suzanne. Thank you so much, Suzanne. That's just an excellent and a very informative presentation, especially to understand that uh, peaceful reunification must be achieved through information, information sharing. We had a program recently too where uh, citizens of North Korea uh, were watching South Korean soap operas and uh, those would be smuggled in by the balloons and uh, the little uh, you know thumb drives would go with them and they would open it up and they'd see how the South Koreans are living you know, and how the culture is the same, same food, same culture, same family traditions, but also uh, South Korea is free and not oppressed and not in poverty. 
and people would change from that. That's one of the most dangerous things uh, for the North Koreans to see is the freedom of the South. And thank you very much for enlightening us on that, that uh, just uh, three nights of listening to the radio uh, could cause a high ranking official to change his whole understanding. Information, truth is, is power. We'd like to welcome at this time, Dr. Thomas Ward. Uh, Dr. Ward is the pro president and professor of peace and development at the Unification Theological Seminary. And over the course of his career, Dr. Ward has traveled between the United States and Korea more than 100 times. He's visited North Korea twice where he met DPRK officials, including North, Koreans found, North Korea's founding leader, Kim Il-sung. In 1992, Dr. Ward played a significant role in an important track to peace initiative inspired and supported by Dr. Moon and Dr. Hakchan Moon, which led to an unprecedented by decision by North Korea to suspend, suspend its annual Hate America Month. Uh, Dr. Ward's written many articles on Korea and the Asia Pacific Journal, uh, Japan Focus, Quarterly East Asia, and E-International Relations. I'd like to welcome at this time, Dr. Thomas Ward. Welcome, Tom. Welcome, Thomas. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Jenkins. I, I, we've, we've had three very enthusiastic speakers and I think each of them brings uh, an important perspective uh, to today's conversation. Um, I, uh, I, want to, I want to do my best to respect the parameters of time, so I'm not gonna speak very long. I just wanna make a couple of simple observations. Uh, as an academic and as a person who has taught in the field of peace and development studies for about 15 years, and uh, I want to just emphasize that there's a, a concept which is, which is well understood among those who study conflict, and that is the notion of ripeness. Ripeness is the point at which a conflict is ready to be addressed in a way other than through violence or through weapons. And it happens in different ways, in different times, in different places. I think that the one experience that all of us lived through was the, uh, the sudden death of um, Leonid Brezhnev, followed by the death of uh, Andropov, which nobody expected to happen so quickly. He was supposedly someone who's gonna be around for a long period of time, uh, followed by the death of uh, Chernyenko. And that, that event opened the path for uh, Mikhail Gorbachev to become the new leader of the Soviet Union. And he had a very different perspective than any of his predecessors had. And it was the time. It was a moment of ripeness. It was a moment when it would be possible to affect real change inside the Soviet Union. And we all know what happened during that period of time. Now, part of being a religious leader a believer is that we know that things like that don't necessarily happen just by human hands, but there's something beyond it that caused that climate to change, that caused the atmosphere to change, and that made it possible for uh, the Soviet Union to be transformed. And I know that one of one of the colleagues who's who's joined us on the panel today, although he's invisible, is Mr. Larry Muffet, and I know that between 1982 and 1988, he plays such a key role in terms of being there, interfacing with Soviet leadership. I had a chance to join him there in 1987 and deal with a bunch of horrible insults and be told that actually AIDS had been, direct, had been deliberately created by the United States government to exterminate everyone in Africa. I mean, that, that we, we, had to, we had to sit through all those things, but suddenly a few years later, everything changed. Everything became different. But I think that Mr. Muffet's role going year after year, and I believe also Tomiko Duggan accompanied him on many of those occasions. One of, the, one of the important parts about that role was that by going there, by interfacing with those people, he became a conduit. He became someone whom it was possible to dialogue with and to reach out to when the appropriate moment came. And therefore uh, with uh, Albert Vlasov from Novosti Press, uh, there, there, was, there was at some point interest in reaching out and in reaching out 
believe it or not, to a, uh, a religious leader, Reverend Sam Young Moon, and to discuss with him and actually to build a partnership, or a more, an, an amazing partnership in, uh, with, with uh, the, basically the seed of communism in the world vis-a-vis -vis an organization which has been very outspoken against communism for decades. And Reverend Moon uh, was even a target of an assassination attempt, as some of you might know, back in, uh, back in 1989 with uh, the uh, Japanese Red Army terrorist, Yu Kikumura, at that time. And there's, by the way, if, if any of you are interested, there is a museum in, uh, in New Jersey, which actually has a Yu Kikumura exhibit, actually talking about all the things that went on at that time. So it's actually available. It's, this is real. You can actually see it. So I make those observations because my point is that uh, there is a conflict. There is a conflict, the conflict we were reminded again by following the failure of the, Han the, the breakdown of the Hanoi talks between the United States and the DPRK. Uh, and likewise, um, the, the decision, irrational decision of the DPRK to destroy the negotiating center at the 38th parallel. Um, we, we find ourselves in a certain kind of a situation and we need to seek a moment of ripeness. And I believe that uh, one of the important points to make here is that I believe that Reverend Moon and also uh, his uh, spouse, Dr. Hak Jahan Moon, they have worked for the past 40 years to keep open a conduit of communication between North Korea and South Korea. It's an incredible task what they've done. And they have not become apologists for everything that's going on in the North, not at all. But they do realize that it's fundamental that there be communication between the two sides. And oftentimes in history, we're finding that uh, religious organizations are in a position to make an enormous difference in terms of communication when there are wars of opposition. It was a tiny, tiny NGO, a Roman Catholic NGO, uh, Archbishop Stallings, uh, San Egidio in that in from Rome that actually negotiated an end to the civil war in Mozambique between two uh, very strongly opposing forces, Frelimo and Renamo. That happened because of a, an NGO community. And likewise, I believe that uh, something very similar can happen in the case of, of Korea in terms of leadership in the North, in terms of circumstances in the North, what's gonna happen? It'd be great if, uh, if Kim Jong-il, uh, Kim Jong-un one day had a, had a dream and his father said, you know, you gotta change, you gotta clean up your act. I'm, 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 I'm hoping and praying for that, you know? But at, at the very least, we, we, need, we need to have it, we need to keep open our communication and we have to look for those moments of ripeness as they appear when it becomes possible for us to affect real change. So I think, Part of the work, in my opinion, of IAPD in the United States, you are an interest group. I believe that you can have an impact upon our media. You can have an impact upon our political parties. You can have an impact upon our various, you know, our executive, our judiciary, and our legislative branches of government. They need to understand your perspective and the call for peace that you are seeking in order to be able to affect, really, the reunification of the Koreas. At the same time, in the North, there is no real legislation. There is no real exec There is no uh, real judiciary. There, there are no civil. There's not a real civil society at this stage. So at, at that stage, we have to work with what we have, and that is with the party. We have to be able to communicate, and over a period of time, when the moment comes, they have to feel that there's a place where they can be able to communicate and act, so we can affect real change. So I feel that one of the key areas of religion is to promote rightness. It's to promote trust. People want to have someone whom they can talk to, someone whom they can be able to confess to, you know, whom they can, they can share with. And I do believe that that's an important piece of this amazing effort of unifying religious leaders and collaborating together, as you have been doing, Dr. Jenkins, through the work of UPF and IAPD in order to affect real change in North Korea. So those are my observations. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Ward. That's just excellent. Uh, we are at the time uh, of conclusion here, but I think that uh, with the audience's permission and our panelists' permission, we would like to extend for five more minutes so that we can have a couple questions. 
first question that's come in is to Dr. Schulte, what was your uh, motivation or what inspired you to devote so much of your, your time, your precious time and your great skill to North Korea? What was it that moved you? There are so many things that a person like you could, could uh, actually be involved with in the world for, for human rights. What, what was it that really brought you into the uh, help for the North Korean people? Um, mute, please. Yeah. How's that? Good? Good. Yeah, no, I honestly, um, I, I, it was, it's, it has not been easy and it, it's been a very, very hard journey and uh, trying to get people to pay attention to the tragedy that was happening. A lot of, a lot of the first people that escaped out of North Korea, people didn't believe them. Just like the, when the Jan Karski was warning about the Holocaust, people didn't believe this was actually happening. So it's very frustrating. But I remember one time we had a hearing uh, on the political prison camps and the story got squashed by the State Department because they didn't want to upset the four party talks. <laughs> and I remember crying out to God, am I really supposed to be doing this? It's so frustrating. I'm having nightmares. And God reminded me very gently that I had I, he was answering my prayer because I had prayed that he would break my heart for what was breaking his heart. And I knew that what was happening in North Korea was breaking the heart of God. Oh, wow. And so I've been working on North Korea, but also on Western Sahara on other people, um, uh, Muslim people who are in a divided country and being horribly persecuted. Um, so those are the two places I've been working on. But it's really those are the things that God called me to do. So I have to say it's totally because of God. Only way I could keep doing it. Thank you for the question. Good. Good. Dr. Schulte, with the heart of God, uh, things can change once we understand that. That's, uh, that's uh, very deep. Uh, Archbishop Stallings, you've known Mother Moon for many years. Why does she have the reputation of embracing uh, not only those who are good Christians and great leaders in the West or in the free democratic countries, but she also will directly engage dictators, presidents, prime ministers who are seen as, as uh, dictators or, or oppressive? Why does she directly go and embrace those people? Because she approaches all of life from the perspective that within each and every person created in the divine image and likeness of God, there is a seed, a cell, uh, within each and every one of us that can be challenged to rise up to the level where one understands the essence of one's uh, divine nature. That uh, first of all, Dr. Hachahan Moon, affectionately known as True Mother, as the mother of peace, uh, in concert with her beloved husband, who stands as co-founder with her, of a, a worldwide peace movement, not a church, but a movement, believes that in each one of us, there is the potential for goodness, for, for greatness. And that she also realizes that in that mantra, which is a, is a hallmark of the movement, not only living for the sake of others, but especially loving one's enemies, is closely connected with the whole ministry of Yeshua HaMashiach, that Hebrew expression for Jesus, the Messiah, the Christ, the anointed one, that our calling as people is really not to be in a position where we're constantly criticizing, condemning, and judging others, but that we appeal to the inner person, to the, the inner sanctum of an individual, to strive to bring out the good within them. And so uh, Mother Moon believes that, you know, if, if there's going to really be true change in a world, we can't just write off people or, or put them into the category of, of being just evil, that there is something within a person that if you can touch it, if you can appeal to it, can soften it and allow that person to see things from a different perspective. Them rather from their own their own standpoint or viewpoint and realize 
that there's a commonality that exists among all of us as brothers and sisters, one universal family under God. Great, great insight, Archbishop Stallings. I know when Father and Mother Moon went to North Korea, they were severely criticized in America and South Korea and throughout the world as engaging a blood, bloody dictator. But now they're receiving accol accolades and respect because that engagement did open the door for dialogue with Kim Jong-il that continued unto today with Kim Jong-un. They do not uh, support any of the actions that are against humanity but they do see exactly what you're talking about, that, that hope, speaking truth to power with love can bring uh, a movement towards the right direction. So thank you very much for your insight. Yeah. Imam Huskik, um, this is a little different question that came in for you. Um, what is being done in the world of Islam at Al-Azhar University or in any, uh, any uh, work with the Sunni uh, Muslims throughout the world to help uh, clarify that the Quran does not support extremists uh, and, and, and deadly actions against innocent people, even if they're of another faith. What is being done to unify Islam on the standard of what the Quran really advocates? The Quran does not advocate murder, except in, you know, uh, uh, anyway, it doesn't advocate murder murder of innocence, mur murder of people. And I know that's not the position of Islam globally. What is being done? I know that there was a conference in Jordan by King Abdullah II that really sought to bring the top scholars of Islam together and they worked. Uh, it was called the uh, Amman Declaration. Uh, what's being done to get the mothers stronger so they can tell their sons uh, that the misinterpretation of the Quran that uh, thinks that they can uh, do something against humanity to to elevate a law is not true. How, what's being done? Uh, thank you for uh, the question. It's very important, the, uh, this question. You know, uh, religion of Islam is a religion of peace, which is recognized worldwide everywhere and explained, mm -hmm. and no violence or terrorism recognized by uh, Islamic teaching. Uh, Surah Al-Maida, uh, chapter 5 and verse 32 and 33, I think, said that if one person kills another person as treated by God, like that person killed entire humanity. But mm -hmm. if one person save another person is treated as he uh, saved entire humanity. So there is no... Uh, there is no space for any violence or terrorism in Islam. Those who are called terrorist organizations, however, they have nothing to do with Islam and Allah according to Quran and teaching of Muhammad peace be upon him. Thank you. Thank you, Imam Huski. Uh, this touches on something that's very important with North Korea. There's a problem of the Juche ideology. There's a problem of the uh, roots of the communist world that are rooted in an understanding that there is no God. And that is the very foundation upon which human rights become impossible in that kind of setting. Uh, because if there's no eternality to mankind, there's no consequence for hurting somebody else. Uh, there's no need for conscience because good is relative, whatever justify the ends justify the means so i'd like to ask dr ward at this time what about the ideological challenges we face with north korea because it is absolute that there is a juche ideology and the people are being strongly encouraged to to study it and continue to try to and adhere to it so what's your thoughts on that and how can we how can we change this direction so god can and religious freedom can thrive in, uh, in Northeast Asia. Is there still a question oh. for me? No, that's for Dr. Ward, Imam. Thank you for your beautiful, your beautiful answer. Thank you. Thank you. You're welcome. Well, I, th I think that this is a problem that we face uh, in Northeast Asia, both in, uh, both in, in uh, North Korea and also in China right now, that there is this uh, um, reliance upon uh, Marxism, Leninism, Kim Il-sungism, as it's, as it's referred to there, uh, 
because it uh, it's used as a way to justify the status quo and to justify those who are in power. It seems to me, Dr. Jenkins, that the place to start, frankly speaking, is with refugees that have left North Korea, because I don't know, uh, you know, for those of you who are not aware, Dr. Moon did a very thorough critique of Marxism, Leninism, in the, uh, that, that he developed from, from the 1950s on. I, I just confess, as a person who was very left-leaning when I came into contact with this movement more than 50 years ago, I was stunned by his analysis. It completely undermined the Marxist paradigm. So effective. And I think, I think it's important to begin as much as possible, maybe with, with refugees, because they have a better sense about how we go beyond that. But people need, to, people need to know why what happened to them happened to them. And the reality is that Marxism, Leninism, it's not effective as an economic system. It's not effective as a political system, but it is a very highly effective instrument for maintaining power. That's the reality. And unless the underpinnings are really fleshed out, observed, critiqued, and counterproposed, we can't get to where we have to go. So that's my thought. Wow, yeah. excellent, excellent. I, I was going to just, something? yeah, I was going to add real quick. Um, Juche is actually, uh, it's a religion and it's the worship of the dictator. My personal, uh, well, my personal view is that Kim Il-sung, who was raised in a Christian household, saw the power of religion because it was the Christian leaders that were fighting back against the Japanese and trying to preserve Korean culture. And I think he saw the power of, 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 uh, of religion. So he formed it. And Huang jan yap who, who helped develop the Juche religion, will tell you that um, it, ha it has all the tenets of a religion. They've taken the Apostles' Creed, they, the grace, it's thank you, Father Kim Il-sung, for my meal. And they've taken all the tenets of the Christian faith and twisted it. And that's why I think you see so much darkness and evil, because it's a perversion of, of the Christian faith. And that's why they, they, they don't consider South Korea America their greatest threat. Kim Jong-un considers Christians his greatest threat. Whoa. Oh, thank you very much. Whoa. This is very enlightening. Whoa. Unfortunately, we've come to a full, full term for our program, but we will have you all back. We're just honored to be with you. I am so inspired to hear this deeper analysis where really it has to do with faith. And that's what this program is about. The Interreligious Association for Peace and Development is centering on faith leaders. Archbishop Stallings, our chairman for North America, and is on the Global Committee. And it's very, very important we understand that faith leaders have a very central role, not just a peripheral role, central role. That's why I just came back from a conference in Korea, which it was called the Interfaith Rally for the Peaceful Reunification of Korea, where there was uh, over a million people online, but there were also faith leaders from every continent and every religion that were praying together. And that's why a Mother Moon as a Christian uh, really understands that you cannot open the door without the spiritual foundation first. So that when Joshua and the people of Israel came together and united at six day march around the city, and then seventh, seventh day, they went around seven times and shouted, that was a religious act. That wasn't, the walls of Jericho did not fall down by weaponry or by force. Uh, it they fell by the word of God or by unity of faith leaders. So this is very exciting. Today's program, I think, will be a great encouragement. I encourage our, our listeners to and, and viewers to go live uh, on our streaming or go back to our streaming. Uh, you can find this program and share it with friends. Uh, this program will gain probably a thousand viewers within a week. It has several hundred now. And uh, that's on uh, Facebook. So we're very happy. Dr. Uh, Tomiko Duggan, if you could please return and give us our, our conclusion. Thank you so much. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Yeah, thank you so much, Dr. Jenkins. Thank you for all presenters. Uh, I remember when I went to a uh, Soviet Union first time in 1982, I was scared to go to Soviet Union. And 10 years later, when I went to North Korea first time in 1992, I was so scared to go to North Korea, actually. But when I went there, I was able to talk to uh, you know, people on the different level. So 
Dr. Shote, I really appreciate what you are doing and communicating a way to uh, inform people in North Korea that there are people who are concerned outside of North Korea. And uh, so uh, thank you so much, uh, Dr. Uh, Archie Bishop Starlings, our national chairman of IAPD. Uh, we work together, continue to really uh, pray, of course, and then we to work together to, to keep hoping the door will open when time comes, right? Right time comes, right, Dr. Ward? Thank you so much for, for listening and then thank you very much uh, you. we pray uh, for the also for the as i mentioned in the very beginning for those who really um uh, lost many uh, of the lives because of the tornadoes touched down in the west midwest we really pray for this time thank you so much thank you all thank you, thank you. have a good afternoon thank thank you. you thank you thank you all god bless you Thank you. Thank you, Imam. Thank you. God bless. Wonderful to see you, Imam. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Ward. 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 Thank you, Dr.